Lovely. Well, welcome to today's webinar, which, as I said just before, is Top 10 Reasons VA Businesses Fail. Um, it sounds very negative, I know, but we're going to be looking at it um, and hopefully putting you know positive spins on everything and helping you look at things you can do to make sure that your business um, moves forward nicely. Okay. So how many businesses don't make it? Um, it's actually from, from the studies that I've got, it's not the first year that you should worry about. You know how you're always hearing people say, okay, you know, 30% of businesses fail in the first year or what have you. Our recent studies say that only 1.5% of Australian businesses fail in the first year. Um, statistical um, information, I'm just going to mute somebody there. Beautiful. Um, firm Vida show that the problem is not in the early days, it's actually sort of around the three to four year block. Um, and the general manager of commercial risk products, Moses um, Samara, Samaha, was um, quoted as saying, the biggest risk isn't in the first year, but in the years they have to be brave and grow. So it's when you've got to step up and outside that comfort zone. So some of the things that I'm going to be going through today are things that people do right at the start and other things are, are those things that people do as they're progressing, sort of, you know, those, <clears throat> excuse me, two, three, four years in. Some of you I know have been going longer than that and um, one of the things that I will be talking about today shows that your presence here today is, is proof that, you know, you are doing the right stuff. So it's really, really cool. Personally, I've seen many businesses come and go. Um, so these are the things that I've noticed about the people who succeed and those who don't. Um, through the network, I've literally had hundreds and hundreds of VA businesses come and go. There's some that have been on the network since it started 11 years ago. Um, and I wish I, st I had those stats. I didn't have good stats at the start because I'd love to celebrate that. Um, but I have seen a lot of businesses start up with good intentions, but there's key things that just weren't happening and it's pretty consistent. So I think that if you look at this sort of thing, it'll be a little bit of a recipe for you and you should, you know, if you look at, address them all, you should be right, I think anyway. So the first one is forgetting that you are the leader. And when I was doing research, I'm just going to read this out to you because I absolutely love the wording here. So this is um, Eric T. Wagner's just, he's a, just, he's actually, he's a business consultant um, and was quoted in Forbes and said, um, you need to wake up to realise it's your baby. And you hear me say that all the time, your business baby. You're the founder, which makes you the leader. Matters not if you're a business of one or 1,000 lack the ability to strongly relate with people, gain the skills necessary to do so. Struggle with anger issues, solve it with anger management. Entrepreneurs who succeed spend time with personal development. I've never once met an angel or venture capital investor who doesn't investigate the character of a founder and his or her team before whipping out their checkbook. And same goes with clients. You know, they're going to be, you know, sussing you out a little bit before they invest in you. Um, it still amazes me how many business owners who actually have good ideas with the ability to, ability to execute them crash and burn because of their own dysfunction. Please don't be one of them. So this is also around the whole, you know, employee business mindset. And you will hear, you know, people who have been in business for a while talking about that quite a lot. The whole business mindset is quite different. You've really got to look at things from a, a different viewpoint. Uh, your clients, um, they're not... Uh, they don't owe you an income in any way, shape or form. They don't owe you work. They're not actually, you know, liable for your income. When you're an employee, you've got certain securities there. You've got, you know, people batting for you to make sure that you can keep your job and there's no unfair dismissal and there's that, you know, reliability there. But, you know, your obligations to them are very, very different as, as is their obligations to you when you're an employee, sorry, an employee, you're a business owner versus an employee. It all just changes up and you're on exactly the opposite side of the fence. So you need to always remember that you are the leader of your business and act like it. And you need to make sure that as the leader, you have the skills and the qualities that are needed in the leader. And that's what Eric T. Wagner is talking about here. If you've got some of these issues, so, you know, you don't have great, communication skills or relatability skills or you've got 
issues with how you respond to situations that aren't going your way, sort it out. You have to sort that sort of thing out. My business went to a higher level when I got a coach in who helped me, as scary as it was, to look at emotional intelligence because I wanted to take more control over the way I reacted to my environment because clients are going to piss you off. Situations are going to make you angry and how you react to them as a leader can make or break you. Would you say that's fair? Yeah. Yeah. It's a tough gig and that's why running your own business is not for everyone. It just isn't. So always remember you're the leader and with that comes great responsibility. Awesome perks as well, but a lot of responsibility. You've got to be the proper leader. So my second one that I look at, because I've got 10 points here for you today, just worked out that way, failing communication with prospects. This is all part of understanding who your ideal client is. So if you, and I know that in other webinars I've spoken to your, you know, that I've had attendees along, they've said, you know, they just want to work with someone. And there are people in this webinar at the moment who are really, really new. So who can relate to the sentence, I just want a client, any client will do? No one? <laughs> yeah? Nicole, exactly. Once upon a time, yes, not now, not now. And the people that are saying not anymore um, have been in business for a while because they realise that, you know what, you don't want that. That is not what you want. So when you've got an idea of who your ideal client is, you can communicate better with that ideal person. And the reason why you want the ideal person is because, as Mon so eloquently put it in the chat bar thing, some people are just jerks. <laughs> and you know what? When you've got to deal with that whole leadership thing and you've got to, let me just see who's come off mute. Hi, Annette. How are you going? Um, when you've got to deal with the whole leadership thing, you um, it, it's hard to do that if you're trying to run a business and satisfy the needs of everybody. Because some people are going to come in and they're going to hate everything that you do. They're going to be mean about it. If you look at my, my webinar from last week, Toxic Clients, they're going to be those people. They're going to be impossible to please. So when you know who your ideal client is, that's okay, um, you can communicate better with your prospects because you'll know how you can ease their pain. Your ideal client will have a pain point that you can ease. That's one of the key things you want to know about your ideal client. So you want to be able to put yourself in their shoes know how their pain can be eased. So does anyone here, is anyone able to give me an example of what their ideal client's pain point is? And you need to make it easy for them to resolve that pain. For Monique, yet yeah, not being able to write copy. So their pain is that they can't get their message out. Would that be fair? So if you came back to them and you said, yeah, and if you said, I can write your copy, okay, so just tell me what you want, but you don't actually make it easy for them and, and ease their pain and ease their apprehension and confusion about how that whole process works and you don't make it easy for them, then you're not really easing their pain. It's kind of like, you know, chopping off their leg to, to fix a sore ankle, do you know what I mean? <laughs> You want to be able to say, okay, we're coming in with a bandage and this is how we're going to do it. We're going to wrap it up and we're going to you know, pop, pop you on some crutches and you're going to be on those for two weeks and blah, blah, blah. So with the copy, you know, we, what we're going to do is there's a couple of ways depending on how you work and as, as the copywriter and as the ideal client, um, maybe they respond better with having a phone conversation. Maybe they would like to start with putting some bullet points down for what they, they need. You need to look at what will be easy for them so that you can ease their pain. Um, Nicole, I'm just reading your comment here. I use that term, ease your pain, when I was selling my services to a client. 12 months later, I still have them and they are desperate for me to help them still. You know what? You can ease their pain. Um, it doesn't mean that their need is going to go away. You might still, they might still need you or they'll have a new pain as their business grows. 
it's really important to remember how you can ease someone's business pain. It's a really good sentence to, to work with. Look at how they communicate and, and what, what makes things hard for them, okay? So the, the thing that will make it ease their pain. So if, for example, when Monique was talking before about writing copy, um, is it they're, because they're dyslexic or they just don't have a gift of the gab or they don't have time? What is making it hard for them? And make it easy. That will make you their favourite person. And so then when you can communicate with their prospects and ease, you know, tell them how you're going to ease their pain and make it ease their pain in terms of understanding how you're going to do that, then you're going to be able to convert the right people. I don't want you to convert the wrong people, so you do need to know who your ideal client is. Does that make sense? Yeah? Beautiful. Any questions, just ask, because I do tend to ramble a little bit. Shock horror. Okay. Slightly different is failing communicating. Uh, Carol, sorry, I'll go back to you for a sec. Carol, don't know how to work that out. Is, is that in terms of who your ideal client is? Yeah. Um, I highly recommend you have a mentoring session and nut that out. Um, and it can also be a case of um, working with a few different people and seeing um, what works for you, what brings out the best in you. As a provider, what makes you stronger, what's more efficient, um, what energises you. So just creating a, a tick list and a cross list um, of, you know, who is actually going to be the ideal person to work with, who has the pain that you can ease. Because if you find the people that have the pain that you can ease, those people are going to love you. And if clients love you, they'll tell everybody else about you. You'll love your work. Everyone will be happy and you'll be an awesome VA because you're only working on things that are going to get big ticks. That's how great businesses work. Yeah, so Nicole said, yeah, mentoring sessions are awesome. They are really, they are worth it, definitely. So with communicating with clients, just moving on there, um, these people are now invested in you. So you've got them past that first little bit there. You need to reward them for their investment. You need to keep them informed. So you said to them, this is how I'm going to ease your pain and we're going to do it this way, this way and that way. And then there's, maybe they've handed over some files and they've handed over some money. Don't just do heads down, bums up. You need to keep them informed. So you need to consider what they are really paying for. Again, they want you to ease their pain. Now, if you go off and, for example, I'm an analogy person, this is how I work. For example, I hire a builder to build me a house, okay? He says, all right, we've got your, your lot of land here. We're going to build this house. This is the design. It's going to be amazing. It will take three months to do. We've got everything we need. You can sit back and relax. You, you know, you've given me what I need. And I go, sweet, here's the money. Get started. If that builder doesn't tell me what he's doing as he's doing it, but he gets the job done in the three months that he's told me, I will most likely have spent three months completely stressed out because I don't know what the status is of my home build. I'm paying for you to ease my pain, not swap it for a new one. I'm tense now just thinking about someone doing that. So you get the job, work out a way so that you can keep them informed, keep them feeling confident without them being, you know, needing to hover so they can relax. One of the things I've got set up at the moment, this works for me, it's different for everyone, you need to work out what works for everybody else, for you and your clients, is um, you all know that I have job leads that come through on the network. They come in, they automatically get posted to Trello, I use Trello, because I've got that set up on my system, they come through the website, the website sends them automatically to Trello. I can see as soon as Monique moves them from to do to done, and I can see as soon as, you know, someone's responded and she tells me who's responded because it sends me a push notification on my phone. So I'm not ever sitting there going, oh, has that, has that happened? Have we got a job leading? Do I need to go and look at it? It comes to me as needed so I'm always feeling confident that the job is in hand. I don't need to hover. Monique doesn't actually have to do anything to tell me what's going on apart from move an item from one box to another. And that's to help her know where she's at with it as well. 
So do you know what I mean when I'm saying that? You, you know, just keeping them informed, communicating with them. If they are the sort of person who needs you to pick up the phone and have a chat to them once or twice a week, you need to factor that into your costings. If that doesn't work for you, they, they are not your ideal client. Maybe VA work's not ideal for you. But, you know, some form of communication, an email, a phone call, work it out. Work out what's going to ease their pain as the project, as the ongoing work is being provided. Okay? Does that make sense? Clear communication is so vital when working virtually, Mon says. Absolutely. It is so important, which is why it's at the start of this webinar. It's so, so important. And as I said, people communicate differently. I actually don't want my VAs to call me and give me an update. That doesn't work for me. But for some clients, that's really important to ease their stress. That's what works for them. Yeah? I need a little push notification to come through. That works for me. Or a message through Facebook, you know, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more likely to have lunch with Monique than have a chat on the phone. <laughs> and that works really well for us. And the, the relationship we have, the way that we communicate, um, would not work with other clients that I've had and other clients I know that Mon has. So you need to be flexible in how you're delivering your communication. But remembering if there's a style of communication that does not work for you, then they are not your ideal client because you're not going to do it well. Your ideal client will make sure you do it well. Okay? I think that's the next slide. Let me just double check. Beautiful. Going it alone. Has anyone seen the ad where the lady says there's these two people in a restaurant eating and this guy comes up, I think he's speaking Italian, says something or other, and the um, waitress translates and says, a ship in the harbour is, I think she says, safe and secure but that's not what it's built for. I love that. I absolutely love that. You can, you can keep it safe, but what is the point? It's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to achieve anything. My line is, yep, you can play it safe and it's safe to say you will fail. Yeah, it's a great ad. It's really beautiful. The reason why I say this is because I have come across person after person after person who has said when they've started their business, I can't tell people what I'm doing. I can't tell my friends and family what I'm doing. They won't support me. Um, and I'm worried that, you know, what if it doesn't work? Well, you know what? Guaranteed to not work, unfortunately. You know, if there's someone in your life who you absolutely despise, well, fine, don't tell them. But unfortunately, going alone in business is a really, really bad idea. Okay? You need to work with people. You need your family and friends to understand um, even if vaguely what it is you're doing, two reasons. One, they can respect, or well, three reasons. One, they can respect um, the time that you need to dedicate, the fact that you are working from home. Two, excuse me, two, they might actually have some great advice and skills that they can offer to you to help you grow. And three, if they understand what you do, they become your sales team. Not all of them, but some of them. Some might even become clients. That's, you know, neither here nor there and, you know, may work for some and not for others. But it's great if you've got family and friends who get what it is you do and, and can say with confidence to their own community, oh, hey, sorry, did you say you need someone? Oh, you're a tradie and you need someone to help with your answering the phones? Oh, I totally have, you know, my sister or my friend Sally over here does that. Um, she's a virtual assistant. You should check it out, you know, as opposed to, um, oh, you need someone to help with your phones because you're a tradie. Oh, that's nice. I'd love to help you, but I don't know anyone who does that because they're too scared to tell me. Might sound harsh. Running a business is not about staying comfortable. Okay? Not telling people is the worst marketing strategy ever. Ever. <laughs> you have to tell people. And along the same vein, not networking and building a community. I think networking and building a community, I word them differently because people seem to look at them with two different parts of their brain, but they are the same thing. When you're networking, you're not just looking for clients. You're building your team. You're building your community. And I have a lot of people who say to me, oh, my gosh, if I need someone to help me with something, I know I can ask Rosie. She'll know someone. 
and she'll know someone she can or can't recommend. You know, someone she can say, yep, that person will be perfect for you or, you know what, probably they might not be the right style for you because I have a huge, huge business community and that means that people come to me for that advice and that networking and that connection. It's a really amazing asset to have for me and for my peers, okay? So whenever I'm talking about networking, I'm talking about building that community as well as just, you know, networking to meet new people for clients or subbies or whatever. Um, so your community becomes your sales team, but they also become your directory of resources. Networking online is really important. Obviously, you've got to be competent at this. You've got to be smart about it because you are a virtual assistant or a virtual business provider. You need to prove every time you speak online that you are someone that can be trusted, um, who is reliable, who is human, um, who is connectable, you know, who, who they can just relate to. Um, and when you're networking online, you're building stronger relationships with so many people. We're really, really lucky that we have this. Um, available to us now. It just wasn't available in the same capacity a few years ago. So when you're networking online, yes, you're advertising your business, but not just by blatant ads. That just doesn't work in our current climate, okay? So you're networking online to learn more things from other people, to build your community, to, yes, tell people about what your services and what you're offering, to ease people's pain to a certain point. So, you know, funneling them into your business. Um, and yeah, and just generally building that community. Um, networking offline is the same thing and it is just as important, if not more so. And I run a virtual assistant network. People probably think that I would say to them, oh yeah, you've got to network online. You've got to be a part of Viva. You know, that's how your business will succeed. And yeah, it's a great asset. But if you don't network offline, oh, you've dropped your odds of succeeding quite significantly. I firmly believe that. Um, I was in BNI for a long time, not at the moment, but um, one of the things that they always go on about, you'll hear people saying it, is that people work with people that they know, like and trust. And you can create those relationships online, but it will take you a heck of a lot longer to achieve that online as opposed to offline. You can like, know and trust somebody after one or two meetings. You won't achieve that online. You just won't. You need to. There's a lot more. You're hidden online to a point. You can pretend to be whoever you want to be, and people are aware of that. Um, networking offline, yes, it's going to be more local. That's not a problem. Um, and you hopefully would be networking with um, people that that are both in your ideal client sort of category. So when we talk about your ideal client, we say you need to be networking where that ideal client is. If my ideal client is um, a 30-something-year-old mum who has a child in kinder, um, who is running a business that um, often does markets and stuff like that, um, very hands-on, time-focused type of business. Um, you know, I'm just throwing things out. You know, she, she loves playing tennis. She's quite sporty and all that sort of stuff, and she's seriously time poor um, and is determined to make her business work for her so she can be at home to be with her kids. Um, and, you know, ramp it up when they're at school, okay? So where would she hang out? If she loves Facebook in the evening, um, on the weekends, she's at markets, um, and, you know, I could keep going and going and going. So when I'm networking offline, I want to get myself to some markets and meet these people, but that's not the only networking. I still need to build my community, and my community needs to include people who are not my ideal client. So people that are resources, people who are mentors, um, advocates, everything like that. Um, just having a look at the comments here. Bear with me. Um, Nicole says, I live in a small town and only two networking groups in the area. One is run by another VA um, and the second she does all the work for the committee, so it's not easy to get in there. Um, I've got a couple of thoughts on that. I'll just answer that in just a second. Um, bear with me. Um, Jane says, part of my networking is volunteering at festivals and expos. Absolutely awesome. Yeah. And my business took off because of Rotary. I joined Rotary. Um, yeah, I doubled the, you know, female population and dropped the average age by about a decade. And I got my biggest initial client that way. And I was helping them with their festival as well. 
Um, and that was great showcasing of my skills. Plus, it's giving back to the community, shows what sort of person you are. Katrina, uh, loads over my way. I could only get into one that didn't have another VA. Um, and you know what? I, I want to talk about the other VA thing, both from Katrina and Nicole's perspective. Um, Mon says, my local group was full of farmers and shop owners, not my ideal clients. It's not always easy being rural. But yeah, as I said, your local group, they're not your ideal clients, but they can still be your community. Um, you know, your farmers and your shop owners are still talking to a lot of people. They could become your sales team, whether, you know, whether you mean it or not. Um, and, at, and it says, Nicole, maybe you could work with the other VA and complement each other. Thanks for saying that. I totally agree. Um, I pretty much, in all my years of running virtually yours, I've never found two VAs who are exactly the same. Um, even if they had exactly the same ideal client, their delivery would be different um, or they would have the same sort of delivery and a different ideal client. There's never, ever exactly the same. The strongest VAs partner with other VAs and collaborate and support each other. Um, Nicole, my main marketing is other mums at schools as most have their own businesses. Yep, beautiful. And when I'm talking ideal client, I want you to be really, really specific. Okay, so I've, I've had a few people say, yep, my ideal client is a small business owner, female. That is about a 2% of how specific I want you to be. Um, yeah, Katrina, that can be hard. When, when the networking group is um, industry exclusive, so you can only have one member from each industry, that is obviously harder when you don't have the choice to get in there and partner with the other VA. What you can do is possibly... I mean, it's kind of like saying, um, when, when you're talking virtual, this is how I would use my, my gift of the gab to get in there. <laughs> if you've got in that networking group, so say it's B&I, and this does work, this is how it works, um, you could say to them, look, me being a virtual assistant is not an issue with the other person who's a virtual assistant in there, and have a chat to that other VA as well. Because as I said, your services are probably quite different. If they're not, you need them to be. You need to tweak whatever you present at that group and the reasoning there is because if you say oh there's a VA in that group I can't go in to me that's like a plumber saying oh there's a tradie in that group yeah they're an electrician but they're a tradie there's only one per industry do you get where I'm where I'm going with that it's about your service not about the fact that you're a VA VA is such a broad broad term yeah Beautiful. If you think that you could complement each other, if she focuses on a different area to you, get in there. Because just think, always think, how does this work for the trades industry? Because I find that really, really helpful. <laughs> so networking with your peers. This is where Rosie starts to get on her soapbox. Their casual lunches, they are really important. I'm constantly being told, Rosie, I'll come to that lunch um, if I don't have any work with a client on that day. Okay, and I go, okay, that's fine, because you're not my mentee. If you were my mentee, you would hear a very different response from me. <laughs> and that response would be, you need to work around your business to schedule in networking. And peer-to-peer -peer networking is just as important as all the others. It might look innocent and fun because it's a casual lunch, but by God, you get a lot out of that in terms of building your community. The strongest VAs in the network, in the sorry, in the industry, in our networks, know each other well. You will never achieve that until you you realise the importance of those catch ups. Okay, elegantly stepping off soapbox now, and I said building your community. Okay, really important. You don't do that stuff, your business won't won't go where you need it to go. Undercharging and cash flow. You need to know why you're charging what you're charging. Um, some people will just say, okay, well, this is what everyone else is charging for that. That's what I'm going to charge for that. You can't calculate it that way. Katrina, is it this the undercharging and cash flow? Is that you? Yeah. <laughs> you need to know. All right, consider when you set your price, what is it going to cost you to deliver it the way you want to deliver it? How long is it going to take you to deliver? What sort of hands-on time is involved? 
That can be a fact, it cannot be. Sometimes you've got things that you can resell. So don't rip yourself off just because you've created a template that can be resold, all right? Don't assume, okay, well, it's not going to take me very long. It's not worth much. Ah, uh, big buzz. No, 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 ba -ba Okay, but you need to, when you're considering your, your first up prices, you need to think about how long it's going to take you. What your income needs to be for you to keep running this business, what your ideal goals are there. And then you need to work out what you're going to need, you need to cost, charge. So if, if I say, okay, well, I'm going to be um, delivering um, web development services, okay, for example, obviously an area I know a lot about. The way that you will see that they are priced so, so differently across the board websites. You can get a quote for 200 bucks over here to 20,000 over here. And it might actually not be that different in terms of um, what the original scope has been. The reason being the difference, one, sometimes it's confidence, <laughs> I'll be honest there. But two, think about, okay, so I'm going to do, uh, um, create this website for someone, I'm kind of thinking off the top of my head here, a little bit distracted by some wailing going on in the background. Um, when I deliver this website, I am going to factor in, the, in that I will be meeting with this client because this client um, feels a lot more comfortable and secure with me being there and showing them how it works so that, cause, because the whole web thing is completely foreign and terrifying for them, okay? So that's part of my delivery. That's going to cost. It's costing me time. It's costing me effort, okay? Um, I also include um, hosting and domain name in mine. So there's a product there that costs. Um, I will include some follow-up stuff with mine, blah, 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 blah. This is what it's going to cost me to deliver. This is how long it's going to take me to do it. And at the end of the day, I need to be earning this amount to um, make my business work for me. Can you see how I need to factor all that in? What Joe around the corner is charging for their website really has nothing to do with me. Because I don't know, I mean, I can do my research, but at the moment, I don't know what Joe's doing. Is Joe doing face-to-face catch-ups? What does, how inconvenient is that or convenient is that for Joe? Um, what's involved in that catch-up? Are there templates and products there that will ease the client's pain? Um, is hosting included? What sort of hosting? So many questions, okay? And that is where people go, okay, well, I need to just charge what everyone else is charging. And that's where problems arise. Okay, you need to really think about the value of what you're delivering before you set your prices, okay? And in terms of cash flow, um, you don't want to be um, constantly chasing is where I'm going with that. If you can get, if you're doing general VA sort of stuff or, or um, project related things that are quite consistent, you know, if I'm doing um, e-newsletters and some copy um, every single month for someone or bookkeeping, then you need to package that up and you get them to pay um, fortnightly or monthly or whatever it happens to be. You can start getting a bit clearer on your cash flow and have a little bit of security there. Because without a little bit of consistency in your cash flow, it can be quite stressful. And the last thing you want to do is, is to chase up a client who's one week late and you're really stressed and the way you communicate with them is going to be quite unpleasant because you're stressed because your cash flow is poor, because you haven't got good systems in place to manage it. It's actually not really that client's fault. And I know I've been a week late with things. I'm not an evil client. And, you know, you, you do have the whole, well, people need to pay on time and you've got, you're the leader and rah, 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 rah. But, it, you know, service delivery is a little bit different to retail in some, out, um, some aspects. And you do need to um, be somewhat flexible. I don't mean getting stood on, absolutely not. Everyone who works with me knows that I want you to be, you are the boss of your business. But if you're pleading for money because your cash flow is so bad, um, you're going to be stressed and you're going to look bad. So try and think of ways to improve your cash flow. And I'm not actually giving you complete solutions on that because that's a whole, that's a whole course right there. <laughs> so it's overhanging kind of points. Does that make sense? Are we all still on the same page? Yep, spot on, nice. Anyone find differently? Anyone going willing to challenge me and say, no, that's actually not right and I'm cool with that? Nope. If you find, if you've experienced something different, there's a few VAs 
<laughs> Nicole, not when your soapbox is handy. <laughs> it's right here. <laughs> There's a few VAs that are in this chat um, and they've been there, they've done that, they know what it's like. So if you've experienced something different, let me know. I'm one person. Yes, I've viewed a lot of different situations, but I'm still one person. The next one, pet hate. <laughs> Jack of all trades, master of none. No one will believe you can do it all. Can you tell me why no one will believe that you can do it all? 10 points to the first person. <laughs> Monique, I hate this. I know we've both got to. <laughs> That's right, because you can't. All right? You just can't. It's not possible. You cannot be an expert in everything. So I've got two case studies here. Consider a GP and a paediatric allergy specialist. You go to the GP because the GP is great, right? Um, sometimes. Um, you go there, you expect them to have an overhanging uh, knowledge of all the ailments and stuff like that, right? You go in there and you've got your Medicare covers, you, and you might be out of pocket. If you're not covered, you know, or you don't fall under whatever the brackets are, maybe you'd be 20, 40 bucks out of pocket, 60 bucks, I don't know. Not a huge amount for someone who's giving you some generalist um, medical advice, which is needed. It's important. It's great. Um, but then, you know, the GP goes, okay, well, you actually need to send, oh, I felt it wrong and it didn't tell me. You need to go and see a paediatric allergy specialist for your child. The paediatric is not wrong there. And it's torturing VAs across the world right now. Um, now, if I go to the paediatric allergy specialist, I instantly have a heart attack and think, oh, my God, I'm going to need to, you know, pull on my mortgage because this person is a specialist. They are the master of paediatric allergy specialists. They're going to be useless when it comes to cooking advice, useless when it comes to copy, um, useless when it comes to, um, I don't know, paediatric podiatry, which isn't that far off because it's still got paediatric written in it. Okay? But they are going to charge me a bomb and I expect them to be awesome at it. On exactly the same note, a generalist VA who is a jack of all trades can charge out at, I don't know, $35, $40 an hour. You're not exciting me, that's for sure, because I know that you're all right at everything, but you're not amazing. And when you want to ease my pain, I want you to be a little bit amazing. I want you to be a lot amazing. So if you come at me and you go, actually, I'm a social media strategy expert, I go, really? Oh, okay, that's pretty cool. And I instantly assume you charge a heck of a lot more. Instantly. And there are reasons why outside of that that this is hugely be um, beneficial for you as a VA. That generalist VA has to be keep their pulse on everything. They need to know what's going on everywhere online. They need to know what's happening in Word, what's happening in Excel when it gets updated. They need to know about different social media platforms and how they kind of work and, and e-newsletters and stuff like that because they're a generalist. The social media strategy expert can put their head down and focus on social media and keep their finger on the pulse with social media. Okay, They don't have to be an expert in bookkeeping. They don't have to know how to do this, that and everything else because they are a specialist. And that makes their life easier. It makes finding their ideal client easier their delivery easier because they can deliver and create a product that is consistent across the board, whereas a generalist VA has to recreate the wheel every time because every client that comes in is going to want something different. Okay? Nicole, I found that nearly every single client wants some kind of social media or marketing regardless of if you offer it or not. Yeah, so imagine if you partnered with someone who was a specialist in that. Yeah? Or if you, if you do that yourself. Yeah, you sub it, you partner with them um, and, you know, look, behind the scenes you say it's a sub, yeah, you have a subby that you use and you can say to the client, this is a person that's on my team and they are specialists in social media strategy and they don't have to cost less. This is my other soapbox. They don't have to cost less than you because they are an expert. Okay, so you say to the client, you want that social media strategy stuff? Okay, this is the price for that. Yep, this is my price for this over here. But you want that, you want to use this team member, it costs blah, 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 because it's a higher end product. Um, yes, Nicole sucks at it, so she gets somebody else in. 
You don't want to just deliver everything just to, oh my God, I need to work for everyone and offer everything for everyone. It is actually a really bad idea. So you specialize in stuff and that's why building your community and your peer-to-peer -peer stuff, you go to that lunch, you find out who you like, who you trust and who's offering awesome services and you go, hey, do you want to help my clients with some stuff? Okay, let's work out an arrangement so everybody's happy. Cool, And this is what I was sort of hinting at before that I love that some of you have been in business for ages and you're here today because you want to keep learning and staying on top of things and figuring out what's going on. Okay, you have to keep learning. And imagine if I said that to you and you're a generalist, that's a lot to keep learning. <laughs> a lot. But if you're a specialist, yeah, it's still going to be a lot. It's obviously not going to be easy, but it's a, a lot more defined. There's a funnel there of things that you need to learn. You need to keep learning. Attend networking stuff. Attend information days, education sessions. Viva offers them. Not everyone takes them up. And I can see by who takes them up who, who is really focusing on the right things in their business. Yeah, so my next doing a course as we speak. So am I. Everyone's got to keep learning. And sometimes you've got to go back and relearn things that you learned a while ago. Yeah, that's right, Nicole. That's why I love everybody that's here. <laughs> because you all get a huge tick for this one. Huge tick. Because you've allocated this time. And I really appreciate the time that you've allocated to this. It's really, really important. That's how you fall behind very fast if you don't keep learning and you don't prioritise learning. People often will say, um, same with, you know, the, the, um, the training day that we've got next month, there are people who will say, um, okay, well, it depends on how available I am in terms of my, my client work um, and, and this is the same as the networking that I said before. You need to manage that because the education and the networking is just as important as everything else and will make your business stronger. You can keep floundering and holding on, you know, and maintaining where you're at, which is fine if you want to do that. But you will start to fall behind if you don't schedule this stuff in and realise the importance of it. It's really important. Not outsourcing. <laughs> you all know what I think about this. You've got to practice what you preach. If there's areas there that you should not be spending time on for two reasons. One, you're either really, really terrible at it or you're, quite, you know, you're somewhat slow at it, it's just not cost effective. Um, or what was my other reason that just went out the back of my head? I'm probably multitasking, another thing you shouldn't do. Um, so you need to be focused on what, a couple of things. One, the 10 points that I've talked about today, you do need to contribute your, your mindset to that and your time to that. But if you're sitting there and you're working on things, for example, um, building your website when that's not an area that you plan on learning or um, that you offer as a service so that you can use it as a bit of an example of how awesome you are, if you actually are quite terrible at it and you're winging it to save a dollar, you're actually putting out there a really low standard of um, marketing. And to me, as a prospective client, if I look at a site and I go, oh, gosh, that's pretty average. It looks homemade to me. Yep, I can see that it's a Wix site. They haven't even taken that branding off the bottom. Sorry if that's you right now. I will say, okay, you haven't actually invested in that and you're not taking yourself seriously. You expect me to. You expect me to hire you to do things because it's obviously that's a smart thing for me to do. Why should I, you know, spend my time on things that are not making me enough money? But you're not practicing what you're preaching and you're actually delivering exactly the opposite yourself when you present yourself that way. It's not cool and it's not going to make your business grow. It's a really bad um, work structure to go to, to excuse me, to utilise. Um, just having a look at comments like website techie backends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Monique outsources that. I know she does. Nicole, yeah, I did, a, did that at the start. Now I'm working on rebranding and doing it all again. Waste of time and money previously. And you're pretty much guaranteed to have to do it all again. Absolutely. If you can create something that has what's called legs, so a brand that can evolve with you and a, a um, graphic designer, branding, marketing expert will know how to do that, then you don't have to completely recreate everything and you look good from the start. 
So and it's the same with any area in your business. If you're spending time and money on things that are not helping your business grow, um, and, and it's the sort of thing that if, look at it from an outside perspective, if someone would look out, if a VA came up to you and had a look at you, and you know damn well that VA would say, you should be outsourcing that to me because, you know, it's a bit silly that you're doing it. Well, then do that. Please, 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 please invest in yourself and your business. If you want to be a hobby, be a hobby. But if you want to grow, you need to outsource. The other bonus for that is that, of course, you get to feel what it's like to outsource and you realise that, yep, this is actually quite hard. Um, I can't let go of my baby. I'm, I'm finding that really difficult. Figure out what you need that VA or the other provider, whether it's a web developer or a, um, a, I don't know, a cleaner, if you wanted a cleaner to come in and give you some time back. Figure out what that person needs to do to give you the confidence to ease your pain. We'll come right back in circle here so that you take that step and outsource. So you're actually putting yourself in the shoes of the client. Because at the end of the day, you are exactly the same as them. That's one of the things about our delivery. And when you understand how that feels, then you can go, okay, well, actually, you know, yep, I gave that job to so-and-so to do, and they didn't communicate with me throughout, and I felt quite sick to the stomach. You know not to do that for someone else. It's actually it's awesome research. So there's a huge amount of reasons why that's really good to do. Inflexible or no business planning. Um, you will come up with, um, you know, if a lot of you will say, okay, I need to do a business plan. I've been told I need to do a business plan. And, yeah, you need to have some, some goals, definitely. Um, how do you know you're moving forward unless you have goals? It's really, really important. You don't need to spend an entire day sitting there working on something very posh. It can just be some notes in a diary. Whatever it happens to be, you need to have a bit of a plan and some goals leading forward. Um, one of the things that you'll see on the screen there is that the little chart. And every time you look at planning, you will see the little bubble there that says evaluate results. Things will change. Stuff will work, stuff won't. Um, and you might find with a particular goal that you start off, you've got your mission statement, which might be, um, I don't know, it could be really, really, it doesn't have to be posh, okay? It can be really, really basic. Um, you're not, you know, a huge big corporation that has to, send something posh to a board you just need to keep it real um, you might go okay these are my drivers so that I can move forward you know this is all lingo that you're not even going to use to be perfectly honest um, my long-term objectives are blah blah and blah um, I'm going to plan this and execute oh my god this changed so you need to change it if you're not flexible with your business planning it's going to be really hard because stuff will change your business needs will change. Your direction will change. You need to be accommodating and flexible, okay? And that's apparently one of the really big reasons why some businesses will fail is because people just stick to their guns and go, no, 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 I'm going this way. It has to be this way. I'm still going to use my space, okay, because that was my goal. I wanted to use my space, you know? Can you imagine that? If someone was still, does it exist? I don't know if it exists. I'm still going to use floppy drives. So that's how I roll, that's not going to work. Okay, you need to evolve and be flexible. Um, and the last one is not being guided. And the call mentioned earlier about that, how much she's found value in mentoring. Having a mentor might sound like an optional extra, but it's not. Um, it's really, really worth it if you find the right person. Um, and everybody has, you know, different types of fits that work for them. The reason being is that you're investing in it and you're, you're, you're not just that you've invested in it, but you have invested in it. You've also kind of said to someone, you're accountable to someone, I'm going to step up. And you do. Um, you do. You step up and take action because you're accountable to someone who you, your mentor should be someone you admire who has walked the walk and can talk the talk. Um, so as I said there, you know, you've invested more than just money, even though money can be, that's a huge driver for people. Um, it's a huge asset to have the right mentor. This is what a couple of my mentees have said. I asked them this morning to, to let me know if they were getting return on investment. Um, and Rachel said, I saw a return on investment from week one. It's amazing the changing mindset when you're handing over money and are all of a sudden accountable to someone for achieving. 
Um, the mentoring inspires me to level up, keeps me accountable and on track for reaching my new business goals. You should see how awesome she's going. And then Joe's also said, it helps me get the what ifs and the how to's out of my head and solved. Um, oh, that's so nice, Nicole. <laughs> she's just said there that Joe jo loves the mentoring sessions for me. That's so good. That's really nice to hear. So, um, yeah, it's it's a huge asset to have someone there. I've I've had a coach slash mentor for a long time, and not just one, two. I've had different people that I've leaned on, um, and whose advice I go back to quite often. And um, and sometimes you'll have an informal mentor, and sometimes you'll have a formal one. So when you do invest that money, it can make it a bit different, and you you have to make sure that you get your return on investment. Um, if you don't have a financial um, investment in a mentor, it's still you still can reap huge benefits if you've got the right person. So I highly recommend in whatever format it is that you find a mentor. Okie dokie. So in summary, you have to work your butt off. <laughs> it's not easy running your business. If it was easy, everyone would do it. But... Because it's not easy, a lot of people try and a lot of people do fail. There are things you need to do to step up and make it work. It's just not going to be a cruisy ride. Um, if you want it to be a cruisy ride, go and get a regular job um, because that even on the hardest days there, it's still often easier than working for yourself. But the benefits, as many of you know, of working for yourself are pretty awesome. Um, and it just depends on whether you want those or not and whether those benefits work for you. For me, um, it's pretty much always been a no-brainer. I've had um, periods there during the last um, 11 and a half years where I've gone, that's it, I'm not doing this anymore, it's too hard, you know, something has annoyed me or something's gone wrong, I'm just going to go and get a job. And I sort this out by going on to Seek or Career One or whatever they're called and I look at all these jobs where, um, you know, some of the things they ask you to do sound pretty cool and the rest sound really painful and they tell me what hours I've got to work and where I've got to work from. And I know that I'd have to organise for someone else to watch my children grow for me and see the cool stuff and the annoying stuff that my kids do. And suddenly I go, uh, maybe Greg could get another job. <laughs> and I'll start looking for jobs for my husband because <laughs> he's self-employed too. And then I'll turn off the computer and I'll get back into it. I've done that a couple of times. It's okay. That's it's my routine. And I've never, ever, <laughs> I don't pull green. I just go, no, this, this sucks. Maybe Greg can do it. <laughs> and he goes, no, 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 no. We are just not employable. <laughs> well, he's always had a casual job. He's a little bit employable. Um, but, you know, we both run our own businesses and we're really, um, that, that's who we are. And if that's who you are, um, just remember these 10 points. If you've got any extra points, let me know. I would love to add them to this list. Um, but if you remember these, I think you'll do really well. And don't just remember them, do them. <laughs> Does anyone have, have any other tips they'd like to offer everybody else? Or any thoughts? We've timed this perfectly, even with my rambling. Thank you for attending, Nicole. Much appreciated. Nice advice, Mon. I'd like to finish up on that. If all else fails, smile. Yeah, totally agree. It doesn't pay to throw your monitor through the screen, through the, sorry, the window. It just doesn't. <laughs> it's my absolute pleasure. If you've got any other questions, um, always I'll put my details up on here for those who don't have them. Um, you can email me anytime. You can touch base on Facebook. I'm always happy to be Facebook friends with Viva members. Um, Twitter and all that sort of stuff's up there as well. But um, you've all got it in you to do it. But um, you do need to take these steps. And the networking is a really huge one. And the other stuff there is, is all of it's just as important as each other. But um, the key one that I do see where people struggle is the networking. And if you have problems with the networking, you've got fears around that, um, or you're not sure about your ideal client, I invite you to um, do some mentoring with us. We've got the mentoring program. You can do one-off mentoring sessions or you can do our monthly um, ones. 
and I can guarantee that you'll get something out of that. Massive to-do list. That's awesome. Good. <laughs> Danny, I'd love to mentor you if you're interested. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Well done for attending. You're all superstars. <laughs>